We will now be proceeding forward to invite our next speaker of the day here. Siddharth Batalia is the Chief Marketing Officer of Air Asia India, a joint venture between Tata Sons and Air Asia Investment. Siddharth has been an editorial panel member and published author in various industry publications and international marketing journals and is a futuristic and seasoned speaker on travel and tourism, marketing strategy and digital ecosystems at seminars across the world. He will be speaking on the topic delivering economic value through data, digitalization, and personalization. So kindly please, let's welcome, put your hands up in the air together for Siddharth Vitalia, Chief Marketing Officer, Air Asia India. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. I know it's always tough to take the post-lunch session. Uh, I don't have any videos or any explosive content to share with you, but uh, I'm going to try and keep it as engaging as possible um, and open it up to questions after we finish. I wanted to talk about this topic of, of uh, looking at delivering economic value through data and digitization and personalization in the context of digital marketing and, and a lot of the discussions that we've had in the first half of today's session. Um, let me start by saying, I mean, what, what a pleasure it is to be back with an audience uh, like this in the room. I think one of the panel members in the last session also expressed that. It uh, kind of underscores the importance of personal collections, uh, even when we're at the epicenter of trying to celebrate digital excellence. There's a lot that goes into one-to-one uh, -one relations and personal relations. And when we're looking at digital, when we're often looking at binary and data metrics, it's important to remember what we're trying to actually uh, get to at the end of the day, and it's these kind of personal collections that have the most uh, impact. Now, the past year and a half have, have been marked across the world by a vast variety of obvious changes in macroeconomic drivers. Um, in the day-to-day -day that we spend in digital, we often tend to look at the micro, we often tend to look at metrics. But it's important to step back, I think, at this juncture and look at the context in which we're operating now and what is the promise that that holds for the future. Um, if you look at the relationship between organizations and brands, it's not that that has changed fundamentally. The, the fundamentals of the relationships have not changed. A lot of the trends, however, that we have seen, which were chugging along slowly, have got accentuated at an immense pace in the last year and a half. In um, markets like ours, emerging markets, etc., the unique thing which has happened is that a lot of these trends have been driven by a younger and a more diverse consumer demographic. It's again another thing which was happening slowly, but it's got significantly accentuated. I can cite examples from uh, my industry, right, aviation. If you look at the demographic, the flying demographic that was there earlier versus the past year, the most resilient age group has been the 20 to 29 age group. In a period when all other age groups flying fell by about 42%, the 20 to 29 year age group fell only 16%, right? Now, each of these demographics have very unique um, characteristics. And it's not just that age group. At the same time as the age groups, there have been a lot of other things which have happened. You've had a lot of first-time travelers come in. You've had a lot of movement from train travel and a lack of the traditional corporate travel to a new demographic. And that new demographic is bringing new data into the ecosystem. And it's very important to look at how these demographics are engaging with brands and what we can do and what promise that holds for, uh, for the future. If you look at this period of intensive change, what, what's happened for all of us, I think, in the last uh, couple of years, at an individual level and at an organization level, is there's been a massive impact um, at a personal level as well as as organizations. And uh, each of us is, is defined by the experiences that we've had in our lives, right? Uh, those experiences tend to reshape your identities. It does the same thing to brands, it does the same thing to organizations. But what it does at an individual level, uh, and if you look at travel in that context, it's one of the most inspiring experiences that people typically have that, that change your worldview. For some people, travel is about creating a lifelong memory. For some people, travel is about connecting with other individuals, families, friends. We've seen a lot of increase in VFR uh, in the past year. Now, as the world is emerging again, what is happening is you're seeing a move from discretionary expenditure moving from transactional to experiences. It's another one of those macro shifts that were happening that have got accelerated. You had a lot of transactional exchanges of uh, goods which were happening. And we're moving back into the experience economy, which has been around. It's not a new phenomenon. It's been around since the 20s. Uh, I mean, for about 20 years. 
but that's something that has got accelerated significantly and as that experience economy comes in there's a need for a much deeper understanding of the consumer journey because what you're looking for is not transactional anymore you're looking at all the touch points in the consumer journey that will be able to drive loyalty will be able to drive revenue that will create ultimately a differentiated brand identity and each of those touch points has digitization or data at the back end of it if you look at these younger diverse experience economy consumers as i said they exhibit certain characteristics right they are more resilient which we've seen they're more socially aware they're more connected uh, they're more digitally engaged you take the example of our social media while the flying demographic fell by about 50% in the past year our social media engagement went up three times so we revamped our entire systems we invested in online reputation uh, management metrics we launched a new website and mobile applications we revamped our booking engine all those systems we've reached now global benchmarks of resolution times and response times on social media because we realize that that's where people are moving and that as i said is another acceleration of something that should have been done a long time ago apart from india the seven other geographies where airasia india operates have actually closed their contact centers and are operating only on a chatbot so we have an ai powered conversational transactional chatbot that can fulfill 97% of what people typically were doing at at contact centers earlier right what are these experience economy consumers looking for they're looking for new service offerings the speed at which these new norms have come into play um has not just enabled and empowered innovation but in all of our lives it has almost necessitated it it is critical that we relook at fundamental business models and the way in which we do business to survive in the future if you have the aptitude today and you have the confidence to invest in digital infrastructures and to scale then you're primed to pivot for what the future will bring and that's where the economic value will be if you look at classical or neoclassical economic models what they said is that organizations effectively derive uh, a comparative advantage versus other organizations or geographies countries etc from the ownership of certain assets those used to be factors of production human assets capital assets etc or intellectual assets technology innovation if you see the context of the last panel discussion that happened on data privacy and personalization i was fascinated by some of the uh, things that were being said on that a lot of what is happening now is that um especially in times of crisis you look at inequalities that come to the fore whether it's economic inequalities or industry inequalities which bring much more larger macroeconomic changes along with it like the disruption of the gig economy which was seeing a massive increase or the consolidation that is happening in a lot of the industries because of the scale that is required even to power ai for example you need scale to be able to monetize the ai and the investments that you're doing over there but ultimately what is running at the back of this is data and if you need to remain relevant in the long run like we were talking about data privacy and the implications of consumers owning their data and what they will do with that it is imperative that you are responsible with that data because what will derive that comparative advantage in the future is actually how you deal with that data and so there's a new kind of asset which is a moral asset if you can have the ownership of that moral asset then you have a comparative advantage over other organizations because the other factors are much easily fungible right if you measure that morality um it's essentially in the manner in which we engage with stakeholders with consumers with markets with competitors who are also stakeholders in our ecosystem and with the community at large so if you take the example of data the increased regulation that has happened um in the past year and a half has afforded a wealth of new data that firms are not necessarily uh, using at an adequate uh, amount if you look at again airlines where for example with the pnr earlier when a booking came in you had multiple passengers one mobile number today with health and contact declaration forms you have mobile numbers and email addresses contact details at a pin code level and address details of where you're traveling to for every single passenger now there is a uh, personal information sensitive personal information what becomes important tomorrow as this sharing of this data becomes a necessity for consumers in the new ecosystem is how are firms going to deal with that because tomorrow the power is in the hands of the individual and they are going to trust their data with organizations or brands that can that are not going to exploit that data for commercial value or competitive advantage but to hand that value back to the consumer and that is the crux of what personalization is if you can take that data to deliver a better consumer experience rather than try to take that data to move a transaction or increase a conversion 
then you stand to gain a long term benefit from that the relationship of trust between the consumer and the brand is what lowers the transaction costs in the long term it lowers the cost of acquisition all the intangible resources that the consumer spends on gathering information time money the entire need for intermediaries in the ecosystem is because there is data arbitration once you have the data and the consumer trusts you with that data then that need is gone all of that extra resources that are being spent on these various things are handed back to the two entities which are fundamental to the trade the consumer and the brand and that's where the economic value needs to get created so the emphasis by many organizations in in closing what i'd say in the last period has been on deploying hygiene factors uh trying to address tactical measures to deal with the uncertainty the chaos etc but the universal adoption of these tactical measures means that they're not going to be differentiators in the long term what will be a differentiator in the long term is to have a sustainable strategy which is driven by data which is built on a digital ecosystem and which ultimately is using personalization to provide a differentiated experience to the consumer and that's where economic value is moving and that's where i believe we all need to move so that i mean that that's my summary of of this uh, in general but i'd be very happy uh, to address any questions if anyone has hi sir i'm tarun from garuda so uh, would an airline be willing to monetize their user data in terms with other marketers to monetize so i um would an airline maybe that it's a global question would an airline i'm sure there would be airlines which would be willing to monetize it as an as an airline ourselves i would not monetize it and there are there are i mean a variety of, of uh, reasons for that but you have an extension to that question i think that's basically uh, in terms of the personalization you've been speaking about so if a personal person is you know flying to a skiing location so in that terms if you know somebody is going to fly there uh, in some time so you could offer them hotel spaces or the other skiing equipment as well so in terms that is that is the next stage of consumer data where we are moving to i feel yes and i think it's important um uh, again leading to what the last panel said to ensure and we've pivoted if you look at erasure.com as an organization used to be erasure used to be an organization uh, which was an airline company it has moved to essentially becoming a digital travel data company so you have investments now in um you know car ecosystems or uber equivalent ecosystems in southeast asia uh we've moved to selling hotels to selling uh, rentals to selling health to selling all of those things but those are sold on the same platform so when the consumer comes on to that platform they know what they're sharing their data for and what they're buying which is very different from taking that data and handing it over to another company in exchange for their data now it's it's easy to do in a collaborative ecosystem and where 84% for example owned by tata sons so is ihl or taj hotels the uh, monetization of that is is very attractive to do but it's very important to keep those guardrails across the different organizations and tomorrow if i wanted to provide an offer to my consumers who are traveling say from bangalore to delhi at a taj hotel in delhi to stay that offer needs to be on our platform and the consumer needs to book the hotel and once they've made the transaction whatever data is required for that transaction needs to flow to the partner but it wouldn't be correct in my mind to hand over the data of saying this these are the 100 people who are flying into delhi and go market to them uh, yourselves i think that will be doing a disservice to the consumer yeah hi uh, yeah i have a question like uh, to what extent uh, the air asia using analytics particularly the customer analytics uh, to tracking the life cycle right from booking to executing the journey because recently we had the one uh, experience uh, family like where we booked a ticket uh, during this lockdown periods for jaipur delhi to jaipur and the air asia flights remain scheduling rescheduling for so many months and then we found that the ticket got lost though we booked through the make my trip it was the responsibility of make my trip also to ascertain whether the passenger has really got travel or not if not if the flights are not scheduling and it's like four or five and more than uh, kind of 10 residual then money should be automatically refunded to the customer account but yet it has Correct. not happened yeah so so do you have any analytics tools for analyzing these kind of huge cases yes this is exactly the point point i was making in terms of what what you do with that data where the ownership of that data lies and therefore who the consumer trusts with the data now when you make a booking through an intermediary for example uh, the way the process works is if the flight gets cancelled immediately because the money has come through the intermediary the refund moves from the airline back to the intermediary now the intermediary has the choice of refunding that money directly to you 
or waiting for you to reach out to the intermediary and refund the money. And those are governed by the terms and conditions of that intermediary. So if you book on the airline website directly, for example, your refund is instant. As soon as the flight gets cancelled, whether you cancel it or the airline cancel it or is rescheduled, you immediately get it back. It might take three to four days for the bank who has got or the credit card company to process that money back to your account, to your, to to your credit card. But as soon as you have an intermediary, that life cycle increases. In the course of the pandemic, there are many smaller agents, not the likes of the big ones who have, I mean, the OTAs, the large OTAs, have an own reputation to maintain. And so ultimately, because of a regulation, because of their own reputation, those refunds get processed. But there are a lot of smaller travel agents who genuinely had cash flow issues at this period of time and went bankrupt. And that effectively just, I mean, that goes away. That in this case, sorry, uh, in this case it was make my trip, it was not a small vendor, exactly. I mean it's yeah. a big operator. But they remain saying that we have not got yet refund from the operator, you know. Because the next, uh, they are rescheduling to, to the next, they said you are lotted to next flight, that's what the same something they have used to say. You know, so we still reported to them and we are hoping that still they act. How long ago was this? Uh, I think uh, now it's more than years. Last no so let me get, let me get your PNR yeah, after sure, this sure, and, thanks, and make so, sure that so this nice. is sorted. But, <laughs> but in I principle, did. it shouldn't happen. Yeah, but yeah. I I was I am also a tech professional, so I was uh, kind of raging from that point of view because uh, I I generally I advise or uh, free of cost to make my trip on so many things. Right, <laughs> once I booked from uh, uh, Rachi to Delhi and uh, suddenly you know. My older passenger, co-passenger was also booked, you know, mistakenly because they ticked, the, you know, default. And sometimes you miss this. So I recommended certain uh, modification in their mobile apps and they agreed to that. But they did not refund the mistakes uh, which was actually but carried this over is, their app. This is precisely the, the point that I was making. Is that w what organizations do with that data, how they handle it, how responsibly they deal with the consumers, is what is going to determine next time whether you transact with the same organization and whether that transaction is driven by a choice of price. Now, you may have gone through a particular channel because you got a discount at that channel or you got a bank offer or something. And so it's driven by that tactical incentive. But after one or two experiences of this nature, you realize that sharing your data or dealing with a firm that is going to be responsible with that data and with the money that you've given to them is going to make a lot more sense. And a lot of these larger organizations will naturally pivot to that. It's, it's a matter of survival now. It's not a matter of you know, competitive advantage anymore. Uh, but that, that's precisely what I was saying. Thank you.